you're about to see is a crime scene investigation. More importantly, the bloodstain pattern analysis, or BPA. BPA is the interpretation of bloodstains at a crime scene in order to recreate the actions that caused the bloodshed. The importance of BPA is to determine the location and the type of weapon used or whether it was a homicide or a suicide. Let's see what our forensic specialists are up to now. There are three types of blood stains. Passive, which happens due to gravity and usually ends up in a circular form. Transfer, which happens when the murderer flings back his weapon, and then there's blood stains on the wall behind him. And then impact, which happens due to the weapon when the murderer hits the victim or slices the victim. Whatever you feel. There are three types of injury. One, is stabbing. The blood stain for stabbing is a long, thin streak, typically on the wall. Another one is bludgeoning, typically with a bat or an axe, and those tend to be thicker streaks on the wall. Last one is a gunshot. What happens usually with a gunshot is there's a mist on the wall and it's a little bit thinner. When analyzing blood spatter, we use a protractor to identify the angle of impact and we use a piece of string to give a 3D visual representation and to determine the area of convergence and origin. There are four different types of blood spatter. The first one is um, gunshot spatter, which occurs when the blood mists out of the body. The, um, the second one is cast off spatter, which occurs when the blood is expelled off of a weapon. Um, the third one is arterial spray, which occurs when the blood is expelled from a, ble a breached artery. Then the fourth one is expirated spatter, which occurs from internal bleeding. So here our forensic specialists are mapping out a mock crime scene. And you can see that they are using the yarn and the string to try and pinpoint and find where exactly all of the certain points are. So one of the things that we're trying to find is the point or area of convergence. In order to find the area of convergence, you need to determine the path that the blood droplets have traveled. Uh, you use the, the tangential flight path of the individual droplets, and that can be determined by using the angle of impact. The angle of impact is the acute angle formed between the direction of a blood drop and the plane of the surface it strikes. So what we're using all this data to find is the area of origin, which is the three-dimensional space that the blood that produced the blood stain originated from, and these are the measurements that we need to find it. So we took varying points in the spatter and we connected it all to the angle of origin right here. So we can tell that this is the area where the victim was shot. So we can determine the angle degrees of where the bullet entered. These ones right here are almost circular, so that means that they were 90 degrees. So we think that the murderer shot the person around this angle. And down here, the splatter is under 90 degrees, and you can tell by the streaks. And so we know that these are from the impact up here. So based off these strings, we can determine the area of convergence. So how that works is vertical is an X line, horizontal is a Y line, and coming directly out is the Z line, which is typically found in calculus or pre-calculus. And so we use all of this to determine the area 
Nicole over there is calculating our area as we speak. And they all come down to the area of origin right here. Around 4 o'clock last Sunday, we received a call saying that there was a murder nearby. We decided to investigate and what we found was brutal. When we arrived, we found fresh blood all at the scene, contaminating many areas. Not too far, we found the body completely beaten and dismembered of the victim. Right next to the body, we found the murder weapon, or what we supposed to be the murder weapon, a baseball bat with the victim's this blood. This is where the body was found. As you can see, still pools of blood. The murder weapon was found with it. However, the body was moved. And the original spot that he was killed was over there. So we've transferred our crime scene to our lab. And so we can see all the different types of blood stains that have transferred onto our sheet. Over here we have cast off from our weapon, which was a baseball bat. It's real nice. And here we have all of our impact spatter. And we can tell that it was a blunt force because of how thick the spatter is. If it was a gunshot, it would be a thin mist, or if it was a knife, it would be thinner. This would be a lot thinner, so. Determined as a crime of passion, our victim fell into a serious and dangerous love triangle that he could not get himself out. Now, let's take a look at a real-life murder that took place inside of Keddy Cabin Resort in Keddy, California. On April 12, 1981, in Keddy, California, the Sharp family and some friends went to sleep in Cabin 28 in the Keddy Resort Lodge. What occurred next would shock the county and is a crime that is still actively being worked on today. Four people sleeping in the house were brutally murdered. Four people were killed in Keddy, three of which were found dead inside Cabin 28. Their bodies were found by Sheila Sharp, who, unlike the rest of her family, had slept at a friend's cabin next door. Sheila found the bodies of her mother, Sue Sharp, her 15-year-old brother, Johnny Sharp, and Johnny's 17-year-old friend, Dana Wingate. Sheila's 12-year-old sister, Tina, was missing from the scene, but her remains would be found at a different time, a fact that we'll touch on later. Strangely, Sheila's two younger brothers, Greg, age five, and Rick, age 10, were found in the cabin, in a bedroom, asleep and safe. In the same room, also found asleep and safe, was the boy's friend, Justin Smart. When you look at the scene of the crime, it's tough to fathom how they could have slept through such a tragedy. Johnny, Dana, and Sue were all bound to some degree by electrical wiring. These weapons were found at the scene. A bent steak knife found on the floor, a bloodied butcher knife and claw hammer, both found on a small wooden table near the entryway to the kitchen. Blood splatters were found on the walls and ceiling, suggesting the kind of force used Here's some background on Sue Sharp and her children. 
Sue Sharp had left a broken and abusive marriage and was described as a quiet woman who loved her kids. In 1980, Sue moved her kids to the Ketty area where they lived in relative poverty. Let's return to the body of Tina Sharp, the one Sharp sibling missing from the cabin. Tina's skull would eventually be found due to an anonymous tip called into the police on the third anniversary of the murders. The skull was found about 50 miles away in a whole other county. Aside from the timing, which is undoubtedly suspicious, what's truly dubious is the fact that the caller identified the skull as Tina's. But how could the caller have known that based on the skull alone? Let's go over the suspects of which there were really only two examined by the police at the time, Marty Smart and his roommate, Bobo Betty, who lived two cabins down from the Sharps. Let's go over a possible motive. Marty Smart was married to Marilyn Smart, the mother of Justin Smart, who was one of the kids that was found alive and well in the cabin. Marty was reportedly an abusive husband, and there are reports that Sue Sharp had been counseling Marilyn on her marriage. When finding out about Sue's interference with his marriage, Marty reportedly went ballistic about it. Let's go over some interesting new developments brought on by the reopening of the case. The fourth development was the discovery that a man had found a steel blue-handled claw hammer using a metal detector near a pond near Ketty. The hammer matched the description of one that Marty had told investigators he'd lost. As of late November 2016, it was being tested for DNA or blood residue as a possible additional murder weapon. As mentioned before, there were bloodstains on the floor, walls, and ceiling. This was helped to determine the force that the killer used to kill the four victims. The murderer, however, has yet to be found, and the investigation is still open today. Okay. We've determined that this was definitely a crime of passion because Jack was um, cheating on Sally. There we go. Have you got color in your cheeks? Do you ever get that feel that you can't shift the tide that sticks around like summits in your teeth? Are there some aces up your sleeve? Have you no go, idea go, go. that you're in deep? <laughs> I dreamt about you Three nearly times of every night this way. I mean, I see you. Look! It's a pretty visual and just the area of this tune I found that makes me think of you somehow when I play it on repeat. Until I fall asleep, spilling drinks on my sets. <laughs> Crawling back to you Never thought 